Chapter 1, Part 3 of The Eventful History of the Mutiny and Piratical Seizure of HMS Bounty, Its Cause and Consequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Dunlop. The Eventful History of the Mutiny and Piratical Seizure of HMS Bounty by Sir John Barrow Chapter 1, Part 3 The greater part of the food of Otahitians is vegetable. Hogs, dogs and poultry are their only animals, and all of them serve for food. We all agreed, says Cook, that a South Sea dog was little inferior to an English lamb, which he ascribes to its being kept up and fed wholly on vegetables. Broiling and baking are the only two modes of applying fire to their cookery. Captain Wallace observes that, having no vessel in which water could be subjected to the action of fire, they had no more idea that it could be made hot than it could be made solid and he mentions that one of the attendants of the supposed queen, having observed the surgeon fill the teapot from an urn, turned the cock himself and received the water in his hand, and that as soon as he felt himself scalded, he roared out and began to dance about the cabin with the most extravagant and ridiculous expressions of pain and astonishment, his companions, unable to conceive what was the matter, staring at him in amaze and not without some mixture of terror. One of Oberia's peace offerings to Mr. Banks for the robbery of his clothes committed in her boat was a fine fat dog, and the way in which it was prepared and baked was as follows. Toupee, the high priest, undertook to perform the double office of butcher and cook. He first killed him by holding his hands close over his mouth and nose for the space of a quarter of an hour. A hole was then made in the ground about a foot deep, in which a fire was kindled, and some small stones placed in layers, alternately with the wood, to be heated. The dog was then singed, scraped with a shell, and the hair taken off as clean as if he had been scalded in hot water. Then he was cut up with the same instrument and his entrails carefully washed. When the hole was sufficiently heated, the fire was taken out, and some of the stones, being placed at the bottom, were covered with green leaves. The dog, with the entrails, was then placed upon the leaves, and other leaves being laid upon them, the hole was covered with the rest of the hot stones, and the mouth of the hole close stopped with mould. In somewhat less than four hours it was again opened, and the dog taken out excellently baked, and the party all agreed that he made a very good dish. These dogs, it seems, are bred to be eaten, and live wholly on breadfruit, coconuts, yams, and other vegetables of the like kind. The food of the natives, being chiefly vegetable, consists of the various preparations of the breadfruit, of coconuts, bananas, plantains, and a great variety of other fruit, the spontaneous products of a rich soil and genial climate. The breadfruit, when baked in the same manner as the dog was, is rendered soft and not unlike a boiled potato, not quite so farinaceous as a good one, but more so than those of the middling sort. Much of this fruit is gathered before it is ripe, and by a certain process is made to undergo the two states of fermentation, the saccharin and the acetus in the latter of which it is moulded into balls and called mahi. The natives seldom make a meal without this sour paste. Salt water is the universal source without which no meal is eaten. Their drink in general consists of water or the juice of the coconut. The art of producing liquors that intoxicate by fermentation being at this time happily unknown among them. Neither did they make use of any narcotic, as the natives of some other countries do opium, betel nut, and tobacco. 
One day the wife of one of the chiefs came running to Mr. Banks, who was always applied to in every emergency and distress, and with a mixture of grief and terror in her countenance, made him understand that her husband was dying in consequence of something the strangers had given him to eat. Mr. Banks found his friend leaning his head against a post in an attitude of the utmost languor and despondency. His attendants brought out a leaf folded up with great care, containing part of the poison of the effects of which their master was now dying. On opening the leaf, Mr. Banks found in it a chew of tobacco, which the chief had asked from some of the seamen, and imitating them, as he thought, he had rolled it about in his mouth, grinding it to powder with his teeth, and ultimately swallowing it. During the examination of the leaf he looked up at Mr. Banks with the most piteous countenance, and intimated that he had but a very short time to live. A copious draught of coconut milk, however, set all to rights, and the chief and his attendants were at once restored to that flow of cheerfulness and good humour which is the characteristic of these single-minded people. There is, however, one plant from the root of which they extract a juice of an intoxicating quality, called ava, but Cook's party saw nothing of its effects, probably owing to their considering drunkenness as a disgrace. This vice of drinking ava is said to be peculiar almost to the chiefs, who vie with each other in drinking the greatest number of draughts, each draught being about a pint. They keep this intoxicating juice with great care from the women. As eating is one of the most important concerns of life, here as well as elsewhere, Captain Cook's description of a meal made by one of the chiefs of the island cannot be considered as uninteresting, and is here given in his own words. He sits down under the shade of the next tree, or on the shady side of his house, and a large quantity of leaves, either of the breadfruit or bananas, are neatly spread before him upon the ground as a tablecloth. A basket is then set by him that contains his provision, which, if fish or flesh, is ready dressed and wrapped up in leaves, and two coconut shells, one full of salt water and one of fresh. His attendants, which are not few, seat themselves round him, and when all is ready he begins by washing his hands and his mouth thoroughly with the fresh water, and this he repeats almost continually throughout the whole meal. He then takes part of his provision out of the basket, which generally consists of a small fish or two, two or three breadfruits, fourteen or fifteen ripe bananas, or six or seven apples. He first takes half a breadfruit, peels off the rind, and takes out the core with his nails. Of this he puts as much into his mouth as it can hold, and while he chews it, takes the fish out of the leaves, and breaks one of them into the salt water, placing the other, and what remains of the breadfruit, upon the leaves that have been spread before him. When this is done, he takes up a small piece of the fish that has been broken into the salt water, with all the fingers of one hand, and sucks it into his mouth, so as to get with it as much of the salt water as possible. In the same manner he takes the rest by different morsels, and between each, at least very frequently, takes a small sup of the salt water, either out of the coconut shell, or the palm of his hand. In the meantime, one of his attendants has prepared a young coconut, by peeling off the outer rind with his teeth, an operation which to an European appears very surprising. But it depends so much upon slight that many of us were able to do it before we left the island, and some that could scarcely crack a filbert. The master, when he chooses to drink, takes the coconut thus prepared, and, boring a hole through the shell with his fingers, or breaking it with a stone, he sucks out the liquor. When he has eaten his bread, fruit, and fish, he begins with his plantains, one of which makes but a mouthful, though it be as big as a black pudding. 
if instead of plantains he has apples, he never tastes them till they have been pared. To do this, a shell is picked up from the ground, where they are always in plenty, and tossed to him by an attendant. He immediately begins to cut or scrape off the rind, but so awkwardly that great part of the fruit is wasted. If, instead of fish, he has flesh, he must have some saxidanium for a knife to divide it, and for this purpose a piece of bamboo is tossed to him, of which he makes the necessary implement by splitting it transversely with his nail. While all this has been doing, some of his attendants have been employed in beating breadfruit with a stone pestle upon a block of wood. By being beaten in this manner, and sprinkled from time to time with water, it is reduced to the consistence of a soft paste, and is then put into a vessel somewhat like a butcher's tray, and either made up alone, or mixed with banana or mahi, according to the taste of the master, by pouring water upon it, by degrees, and squeezing it often through the hand. Under this operation it acquires the consistence of a thick custard, and a large cocoa-nut shell full of it being set before him, he sips it as we should do a jelly, if we had no spoon to take it from the glass. The meal is then finished by again washing the hands and his mouth. After which the cocoa-nut shells are cleaned, and everything that is left is replaced in the basket. Captain Cook adds, the quantity of food which these people eat at a meal is prodigious. I have seen one man devour two or three fishes as big as a perch, three breadfruits, each bigger than two fists, fourteen or fifteen plantains or bananas, each of them six or seven inches long and four or five round, and near a quart of the pounded breadfruit, which is as substantial as the thickest unbaked custard. This is so extraordinary that I scarcely expect to be believed, and I would not have related it upon my own single testimony, but Mr. Banks, Dr. Solander, and most of the other gentlemen have had ocular demonstration of its truth, and know that I mention them on the occasion. The women, who on other occasions always mix in the amusements of the men, who are particularly fond of their society, are wholly excluded from their meals nor could the latter be prevailed upon to partake of anything when dining in company on board ship. They said it was not right. Even brothers and sisters have each their separate baskets, and their provisions are separately prepared. But the English officers and men, when visiting the young ones at their own houses, frequently ate out of the same basket and drank out of the same cup, to the horror and dismay of the older ladies who were always offended at this liberty and if by chance any of the victuals were touched, or even the basket that contained them, they would throw them away. In this fine climate houses are almost unnecessary. The minimum range of the thermometer is about 63 degrees, the maximum 85 degrees, giving an average of 74 degrees. Their sheds or houses consist generally of a thatched roof raised on posts, the eaves reaching to within three or four feet of the ground. The floor is covered with soft hay over which are laid mats, so that the whole is one cushion on which they sit by day and sleep by night. They eat in the open air, under the shade of the nearest tree. In each district there is a house erected for general use, much larger than common, some of them exceeding two hundred feet in length, thirty broad, and twenty high. The dwelling houses all stand in the woody belt which surrounds the island, between the feet of the central mountains and the sea, each having a very small piece of ground cleared, just enough to keep the dropping of the trees from the thatch. An Otaheitan wood consists chiefly of groves of breadfruit and cocoa-nuts, without underwood, and intersected in all directions by the paths that lead from one house to another. Nothing, says Cook, can be more grateful than this shade, in so warm a climate, 
nor anything more beautiful than these walks. With all the activity they are capable of displaying, and the sprightliness of their disposition, they are fond of indulging in ease and indolence. The trees that produce their food are mostly of spontaneous growth. The breadfruit, cocoa nut, bananas of thirteen sorts, besides plantains, a fruit not unlike an apple, which when ripe is very pleasant, sweet potatoes, yams, and a species of arum, the pandanus, the jambu, and the sugar cane, a variety of plants whose roots are esculent. These, with many others, are produced with so little culture that, as Cook observes, they seem to be exempted from the first general curse that man should eat his bread in the sweat of his brow. Then for clothing they have the bark of three different trees, the paper mulberry, the breadfruit tree, and a tree which resembles the wild fig of the West Indies. Of these, the mulberry only requires to be cultivated. In preparing the cloth, they display a very considerable degree of ingenuity. Red and yellow are the two colours most in use for dyeing their cloth. The red is stated to be exceedingly brilliant and beautiful, approaching nearest to our full scarlet. It is produced by the mixture of the juices of two vegetables, neither of which separately has the least tendency to that hue. One is the Cordia sebestina, the other a species of ficus. Of the former, the leaves, of the latter, the fruits, yield the juices. The yellow dye is extracted from the bark of the root of the Morinda citrifolia by scraping and infusing it in water. Their matting is exceedingly beautiful, particularly that which is made from the bark of the hibiscus tiliaceus, of a species of pandamus. Others are made of rushes and grass with amazing facility and dispatch. In the same manner, their basket and wicker work are most ingeniously made, the former in patterns of a thousand different kinds. Their nets and fishing lines are strong and neatly made, so are their fish hooks of pearl shell, and their clubs are admirable specimens of wood carving. A people so lively, sprightly, and good humoured as the Otahitans are must necessarily have their amusements. They are fond of music, such as is derived from a rude flute and a drum, of dancing, wrestling, shooting with the bow, and throwing the lance. They exhibit frequent trials of skill and strength in wrestling, and Cook says it is scarcely possible for those who are acquainted with the athletic sports of very remote antiquity not to remark a rude resemblance of them in a wrestling match, which he describes among the natives of a little island in the midst of the Pacific Ocean. But these simple-minded people have their vices, and great ones too. Chastity is almost unknown among a certain description of women. There is a detestable society called Arioi, composed, it would seem, of a particular class who are supposed to be the chief warriors of the island. In this society the men and women live in common, and on the birth of a child it is immediately smothered, that its bringing up may not interfere with the brutal pleasures of either father or mother. Another savage practice is that of immolating human beings at the morais, which serve as temples as well as sepulchres, and yet by the report of the missionaries they entertain a due sense and reverential awe of the deity. With regard to their worship, Captain Cook does the Otahitans but justice in saying, they reproach many who bear the name of Christians. You see no instances of an Otahitan drawing near the Iatua with carelessness and inattention. He is all devotion. He approaches the place of worship with reverential awe uncovers when he treads on sacred ground, and prays with a fervour that would do honour to a better profession. 
he firmly credits the traditions of his ancestors. None dares dispute the existence of the deity. Thieving may also be reckoned as one of their vices. This, however, is common to all uncivilized nations, and, it may be added, civilized too. But to judge them fairly in this respect, we should compare their situation with that of a more civilized people. A native of Otahiki goes on board a ship and finds himself in the midst of iron bolts, nails, knives, scattered about, and is tempted to carry off a few of them. If we could suppose a ship from El Dorado to arrive in the Thames, and that the custom house officers on boarding her found themselves in the midst of bolts, hatchets, chisels, all of solid gold scattered about the deck, one need scarcely say what would be likely to happen. If the former found the temptation irresistible to supply himself with what was essentially useful, the latter would be as little able to resist that which would contribute to the indulgence of his avarice or the gratification of his pleasures, or of both. Such was the state of this beautiful island and its interesting and fascinating natives at the time when Captain Wallace first discovered and Lieutenant Cook shortly afterwards visited it. What they now are, as described by Captain Beechey, it is lamentable to reflect. All their usual and innocent amusements have been denounced by the missionaries, and, in lieu of them, these poor people have been driven to seek for resources in habits of indolence and apathy. That simplicity of character, which atoned for many of their faults, has been converted into cunning and hypocrisy, and drunkenness, poverty, and disease have thinned the island of its former population to a frightful degree. By a survey of the first missionaries, and a census of the inhabitants, taken in 1797, the population was estimated at 16,050 souls. Captain Waldegrave in 1830 states it, on the authority of a census also taken by the missionaries, to amount only to 5,000. And there is but too much reason to ascribe this diminution to praying, psalm singing, and dram drinking. End note. Three. The island of Otaheite is in shape two circles united by a low and narrow isthmus. The larger circle is named Otaheite Mue and is about 30 miles in diameter. The lesser, named Tiarabu, about 10 miles in diameter. A belt of low land terminating in numerous valleys ascending by gentle slopes to the central mountain, which is about 7,000 feet high, surrounds the larger circle, and the same is the case with the smaller circle on a proportionate scale. Down these valleys flow streams and rivulets of clear water, and the most luxuriant and verdant foliage fills their sides and the hilly ridges that separate them among which were once scattered the smiling cottages and little plantations of the natives. All these are now destroyed, and the remnant of the population has crept down to the flats and swampy ground on the seashore, completely subservient to the seven establishments of missionaries, who have taken from them what little trade they used to carry on, to possess themselves of it, who have their warehouses, act as agents, and monopolize all the cattle on the island. But in return they have given them a new religion and a parliament, Rysum Teniatis, and reduced them to a state of complete pauperism. And all, as they say, and probably have so persuaded themselves, for the honor of God and the salvation of their souls. How much is such a change brought about by such conduct to be deprecated? How lamentable is it to reflect that an island on which nature has lavished so many of her bounteous gifts, with which neither Cyprus nor Cythera 
nor the fanciful island of Calypso can compete in splendid and luxuriant beauties should be doomed to such a fate in an enlightened age and by people that call themselves civilized. End of chapter 1, part 3「Of the eventful history of the mutiny and piratical seizure of H.M.S. Bounty, its cause and consequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads. The eventful history of the mutiny and piratical seizure of H.M.S. Bounty by Sir John Barrow. Chapter 2. The Breadfruit. The happy shores without a law, where all partake the earth without dispute, and bread itself is gathered as fruit, where none contest the fields, the woods, the streams, the goldless age, where gold disturbs no dreams, inhabits or inhabited the shore, till Europe taught them better than before, bestowed her customs and amended theirs, but left her vices also to their heirs. Byron In the year 1787, being seventeen years after Cook's return from his first voyage, the merchants and planters resident in London, and interested in the West India possessions, having represented to His Majesty that the introduction of the breadfruit tree into the islands of those seas to constitute an article of food would be of very essential benefit to the inhabitants, the King was graciously pleased to comply with their request, and a vessel was accordingly purchased and fitted at Deptford with the necessary fixtures and preparations for carrying into effect the benevolent object of the voyage. The arrangements for disposing the plants were undertaken, and completed in a most ingenious and effective manner by Sir Joseph Banks, who superintended the whole equipment of the ship with the greatest attention and assiduity till she was in all respects ready for sea. He named the ship Bounty, and recommended Lieutenant Bly, who had been with Captain Cook, to command her. Her burden was about two hundred and fifteen tons, and her establishment consisted of one lieutenant, who was commanding officer, one master, three warrant officers, one surgeon, two master's mates, two midshipmen, and thirty-four petty officers and seamen, making in all forty-four, to which were added two skilful and careful men, recommended by Sir Joseph Banks, to have the management of the plants intended to be carried to the West Indies, and others to be brought home for His Majesty's garden at Kew. One was David Nelson, who had served in a similar situation in Captain Cook's last voyage, the other William Brown, as an assistant to him. The object of all the former voyages to the South Seas, undertaken by command of His Majesty George the Third, was the increase of knowledge by new discoveries, and the advancement of science, more particularly of natural history and geography, the intention of the present voyage was to derive some practical benefit from the distant discoveries that had already been made, and no object was deemed more likely to realize the expectation of benefit than the breadfruit, which afforded to the natives of Otaheite so very considerable a portion of their food, and which it was hoped it might also do for the black population of the West India Islands. The breadfruit plant was no new discovery of either Wallace or Cook. So early as the year 1688, that excellent old navigator, Dampier, thus describes it. The breadfruit, as we call it, grows on a large tree, as big and high as our largest apple trees. It hath a spreading head, full of branches and dark leaves. The fruit grows on the boughs like apples. It is as big as a penny loaf, when wheat is at five shillings the bushel. It is of a round shape, and hath a thick, tough rind. When the fruit is ripe it is yellow and soft, and the taste is sweet and pleasant. The natives of Guam use it for bread. They gather it, when full grown, while it is green and hard. Then they bake it in an oven, which scorcheth the rind and makes it black. But they scrape off the outside black crust, and there remains a tender thin crust, and the inside is soft, tender, and white, like the crumb of a penny loaf. There is neither seed nor stone in the inside, but all is of a pure substance like bread. It must be eaten new, for if it is kept above twenty-four hours it grows harsh and choky. 
but it is very pleasant before it is too stale. This fruit lasts in season eight months in the year, during which the natives eat no other sort of food of bread kind. I did never see of this fruit anywhere but here. The natives told us that there is plenty of this fruit, growing on the rest of the Ladrone Islands, and I did never hear of it anywhere else. Lord Anson corroborates this account of the breadfruit, and says that while at Tinian it was constantly eaten by his officers and ship's company during their two months' stay, instead of bread, and so universally preferred that no ship's bread was expended in that whole interval. The only essential difference between Dampier's and Cook's description is, where the latter says, which is true, that this fruit has a core, and that the eatable part lies between the skin and the core. Cook says also that its taste is insipid, with a slight sweetness, somewhat resembling that of the crumb of wheaten bread mixed with a Jerusalem artichoke. From such a description it is not surprising that the West India planters should have felt desirous of introducing it into those islands, and accordingly the introduction of it was subsequently accomplished, notwithstanding the failure of the present voyage, it has not, however, been found to answer the expectation that had reasonably been entertained. The climate, as to latitude, ought to be the same, or nearly so, as that of Otaheite, but there would appear to be some difference in the situation or nature of the soil that prevents it from thriving in the West India Islands. At Otaheite and on several of the Pacific Islands, the bread-tree, which without the plowshare yields, the unripened harvest of unfurrowed fields, and bakes its unadulterated loaves without a furnace in unpurchased groves, and flings off famine from its fertile breast, a priceless market for the gathering guest, is to the natives of those islands a most valuable gift, but it has not been found to yield similar benefits to the West India Islands. On the 23rd December, 1787, the bounty sailed from Spithead, and on the 26th it blew a severe storm of wind from the eastward, which continued to the 29th, in the course of which the ship suffered greatly. One sea broke away the spare yards and spars out of the starboard main chains. Another heavy sea broke into the ship and stove all the boats. Several casks of beer that had been lashed upon deck were broke loose and washed overboard, and it was not without great difficulty and risk that they were able to secure the boats from being washed away entirely. Besides other mischief done to them in this storm, a large quantity of bread was damaged and rendered useless, for the sea had stove in the stern and filled the cabin with water. This made it desirable to touch at Tenerife, to put the ship to rights, where they arrived on the 5th January, 1788, and having refitted and refreshed, they sailed again on the 10th. I now, says Bly, divided the people into three watches, and gave the charge of the third watch to Mr. Fletcher Christian, one of the mates. I have always considered this a desirable regulation when circumstances will admit of it, and I am persuaded that unbroken rest not only contributes much towards the health of the ship's company, but enables them more readily to exert themselves in cases of sudden emergency. Wishing to proceed to Otaheite without stopping, and the late storm having diminished their supply of provisions, it was deemed expedient to put all hands on an allowance of two-thirds of bread. It was also decided that water for drinking should be passed through filtering stones that had been procured at Tenerife. I now, says Bly, made the ship's company acquainted with the object of the voyage, and gave assurances of the certainty of promotion to every one whose endeavours should merit it. Nothing, indeed, seemed to be neglected on the part of the commander to make his officers and men comfortable and happy. He was himself a thoroughbred sailor, and availed himself of every possible means of preserving the health of his crew. Continued rain and a close atmosphere had covered everything in the ship with mildew. She was therefore aired below with fires, and frequently sprinkled with vinegar, and every interval of dry weather was taken advantage of to open all the hatchways, and clean the ship, and to have all the people's wet things washed and dried. With these precautions to secure health, they passed the hazy and sultry atmosphere of the low latitudes without a single complaint. On Sunday, the 2nd of March, Lieutenant Bly observes, after seeing that every person was clean, divine service was performed according to my usual custom. On this day I gave to Mr. Fletcher Christian, whom I had before desired to take charge of the third watch, 
a written order to act as lieutenant. Having reached as far as the latitude of 36 degrees south, on the ninth March, the change of temperature, he observes, began now to be sensibly felt, there being a variation in the thermometer since yesterday of eight degrees. That the people might not suffer by their own negligence, I gave orders for their light tropical clothing to be put by, and made them dress in a manner more suited to a cold climate. I had provided for this before I left England, by giving directions for such clothes to be purchased as would be found necessary. On this day, on a complaint of the master, I found it necessary to punish Matthew Quintel, one of the seamen, with two dozen lashes, for insolence and mutinous behavior. Before this I had not had occasion to punish any person on board. The sight of New Year's Harbor, in Statenland, almost tempted him, he says, to put in, but the lateness of the season, and the people being in good health, determined him to lay aside all thoughts of refreshment until they should reach Otaheite. Indeed, the extraordinary care he had taken to preserve the health of the ship's company rendered any delay in this cold and inhospitable region unnecessary. They soon after this had to encounter tremendous weather off Cape Horn, storms of wind with hail and sleet, which made it necessary to keep a constant fire night and day, and one of the watch always attended to dry the people's wet clothes. This stormy weather continued for nine days, the ship began to complain, and required pumping every hour. The decks became so leaky, that the commander was obliged to allot the great cabin to those who had wet berths, to hang their hammocks in. Finding they were losing ground every day, and that it was hopeless to persist in attempting a passage by this route, at this season of the year, to the Society Islands, and after struggling for thirty days in this tempestuous ocean, it was determined to bear away for the Cape of Good Hope. The helm was accordingly put a weather, to the great joy of every person on board. They arrived at the Cape on the 23rd of May, and having remained there thirty-eight days to refit the ship, replenish provisions, and refresh the crew, they sailed again on the 1st July, and anchored in Adventure Bay, in Van Diemen's Land, on the 20th August. Here they remained taking in wood and water till the 4th September, and on the evening of the 25th October they saw Otaheite, and the next day came to anchor at Mateva Bay, after a distance which the ship had run over by the log, since leaving England, of twenty-seven thousand and eighty-six miles, being on an average one hundred and eight miles each twenty-four hours. Of their proceedings in Otaheite a short abstract from Bly's journal will suffice. Many inquiries were made by the natives, after Captain Cook, Sir Joseph Banks, and others of their former friends. One of my first questions, says Bly, was after our friend Omai, and it was a sensible mortification and disappointment to me to hear that not only Omai, but both the New Zealand boys who had been left with him, were dead. There appeared among the natives in general great good will towards us, and they seemed to be much rejoiced at our arrival. The whole day we experienced no instance of dishonesty, and we were so much crowded that I could not undertake to remove to a more proper station without danger of disobliging our visitors by desiring them to leave the ship. Otu, the chief of the district, on hearing of the arrival of the bounty, sent a small pig and a young plantain tree, as a token of friendship. The ship was now plentifully supplied with provisions, every man on board having as much as he could consume. As soon as the ship was secured, Lieutenant Bly went on shore with the chief, Poino, passing through a walk, delightfully shaded with breadfruit trees, to his own house, where his wife and her sister were busily employed staining a piece of cloth red. They desired him to sit down on a mat, and with great kindness offered him refreshments. Several strangers were now introduced, who came to offer their congratulations, and behaved with great decorum and attention. On taking leave, he says, the ladies, for they deserve to be called such from their natural and unaffected manners and elegance of deportment, got up, and taking some of their finest cloth and a mat, clothed me in the Otaheitan fashion, and then said, We will go with you to your boat, and each taking me by the hand amidst a great crowd, led me to the waterside, and then took their leave. In this day's walk, Bly had the satisfaction to see that the island had received some benefit from the former visits of Captain Cook. Two shaddocks were brought to him, 
a fruit which they had not till cook introduced it and among the articles which they brought off to the ship and offered for sale were capsicums pumpkins and two young goats in the course of two or three days says he an intimacy between the natives and the ship's company was become so general that there was scarcely a man in the ship who had not already his tayo or friend nelson the gardener and his assistant being sent out to look for young plants it was no small degree of pleasure to find them report on their return that according to appearances the object of the voyage would probably be accomplished with ease the plants were plentiful and no apparent objection on the part of the natives to collect as many as might be wanted nelson had the gratification to meet with two fine shaddock trees which he had planted in seventeen seventy seven and which were now full of fruit but not ripe presents were now given to otu the chief of matavei who had changed his name to tana he was told that on account of the kindness of his people to captain cook and from a desire to serve him and his country king george had sent out these valuable presents to him and will you not tana said bly send something to king george in return yes he said i will send him anything i have and then began to enumerate the different articles in his power among which he mentioned the breadfruit. This was the exact point to which Bly was endeavouring to lead him, and he was immediately told that the breadfruit trees were what King George would like very much, on which he promised that a great many should be put on board. Hitherto no thefts had been committed, and Bly was congratulating himself on the improvement of the Otahitians in this respect, as the same facilities and the same temptations were open to them as before the ship as on former occasions was constantly crowded with visitors one day however the gudgeon of the rudder belonging to the large cutter was drawn out and stolen without being perceived by the man who was stationed to take care of her and as this and some other petty thefts mostly owing to the negligence of the men were commencing and would have a tendency to interrupt the good terms on which they were with the chiefs I thought, says Bly, it would have a good effect to punish the boat-keeper in their presence, and accordingly I ordered him a dozen lashes. All who attended the punishment interceded very earnestly to get it mitigated. The women shewed great sympathy, and that degree of feeling which characterizes the amiable part of their sex. The longer they remained on the island, the more they had occasion to be pleased with the conduct of the islanders, and the less incommoded either on board or when on shore by the natives following them as at first into every house they wished to enter they always experienced a kind reception the otahitians we are told have the most perfect easiness of manner equally free from forwardness and formality and that there is a candour and sincerity about them that is quite delightful when they offer refreshments for instance if they are not accepted they do not think of offering them a second time for they have not the least idea of that ceremonious kind of refusal which expects a second invitation. Having one day, says Bly, exposed myself too much in the sun, I was taken ill, on which all the powerful people, both men and women, collected round me, offering their assistance. For this short illness I was made ample amends by the pleasure I received from the attention and appearance of affection in these kind people. On one occasion the bounty had nearly gone ashore in a tremendous gale of wind, and on another did actually get aground, on both which accidents these kind-hearted people came in crowds to congratulate the captain on her escape, and many of them are stated to have been affected in the most lively manner, shedding tears while the danger in which the ship was placed continued. On the ninth December the surgeon of the bounty died from the effects of intemperance and indolence this unfortunate man is represented to have been in a constant state of intoxication and was so averse from any kind of exercise that he never could be prevailed on to take half a dozen hours upon deck at a time in the whole course of the voyage lieutenant bligh had obtained permission to bury him on shore and on going with the chief tana to the spot intended for his burial place i found says he the natives had already begun to dig his grave tana asked if they were doing it right there, says he, the sun rises, and there it sets. Whether the idea of making the grave east and west is their own, or whether they learnt it from the Spaniards who buried the captain of their ship on the island in 1774, there were no means of ascertaining. But it was certain they had no intimation of that kind from anybody belonging to the bounty. 
When the funeral took place, the chiefs and many of the natives attended the ceremony, and shewed great attention during the service. Many of the principal natives attended divine service on Sundays, and behaved with great decency. Some of the women at one time betrayed an inclination to laugh at the general responses, but, the captain says, on looking at them they appeared much ashamed. The border of the lowland, which is the breadth of about three miles, between the sea coast and the foot of the hills, consists of a very delightful country, well covered with bread-fruit and cocoa-trees, and strewed with houses in which are swarms of children playing about. It is delightful, Bly observes, to see the swarms of little children that are everywhere to be seen employed at their several amusements, some flying kites, some swinging in ropes suspended from the boughs of trees, others walking on stilts, some wrestling, and others playing all manner of antic tricks such as are common to boys in England. The little girls have also their amusements, consisting generally of havas or dances. On an evening, just before sunset, the whole beach abreast the ship is described as being like a parade, crowded with men, women, and children, who go on with their sports and amusements till nearly dark, when every one peaceably returns to his home. At such times, we are told, from three to four hundred people are assembled together, and all happily diverted, good-humoured, and affectionate to one another, without a single quarrel having ever happened to disturb the harmony that existed among these amiable people. Both boys and girls are said to be handsome and very sprightly. It did not appear that much pains were taken in their plantations, except those of the ava and the cloth plant. Many of the latter are fenced with stone, and surrounded with a ditch. In fact, nature has done so much for them, that they have no great occasion to use exertion in obtaining a sufficient supply of either food or raiment. Yet when Bly commenced taking up the breadfruit plants, he derived much assistance from the natives in collecting and pruning them, which they understood perfectly well. The behavior of these people on all occasions was highly deserving of praise. One morning, at the relief of the watch, the small cutter was missing. The ship's company were immediately mustered, when it appeared that three men were absent. They had taken with them eight stands of arms and ammunition, but what their plan was, or which way they had gone, no one on board seemed to have the least knowledge. Information being given of the route they had taken, the master was dispatched to search for the cutter, and one of the chiefs went with him. But before they had got halfway, they met the boat with five of the natives, who were bringing her back to the ship. For this service they were handsomely rewarded. The chiefs promised to use every possible means to detect and bring back the deserters, which in a few days some of the islanders had so far accomplished as to seize and bind them, but let them loose again on a promise that they would return to their ship, which they did not exactly fulfill, but gave themselves up soon after on a search being made for them. A few days after this a much more serious occurrence happened, that was calculated to give to the commander great concern. The wind had blown fresh in the night, and at daylight it was discovered that the cable, by which the ship rode, had been cut near the water's edge, in such a manner, that only one strand remained whole. While they were securing the ship, Tana came on board, and though there was no reason whatever to suppose otherwise than that he was perfectly innocent of the transaction, nevertheless, says the commander, I spoke to him in a very peremptory manner, and insisted upon his discovering and bringing to me the offender. He promised to use his utmost endeavours to discover the guilty person. The next morning he and his wife came to me, and assured me that they had made the strictest inquiries without success. This was not at all satisfactory, and I behaved towards them with great coolness, at which they were much distressed, and the lady at length gave vent to her sorrow by tears. I could no longer keep up the appearance of mistrusting them, but I earnestly recommended to them, as they valued the King of England's friendship, that they would exert their utmost endeavours to find out the offenders, which they faithfully promised to do. Here Bly observes it had since occurred to him that this attempt to cut the ship adrift was most probably the act of some of his own people, whose purpose of remaining at Otaheite might have been effectually answered without danger, if the ship had been driven on shore. At the time it occurred, he says, he entertained not the least thought of this kind, nor did the possibility of it enter into his ideas, having no suspicion that so general an indication, or so strong an attachment to these islands, 
could prevail among his people as to induce them to abandon every prospect of returning to their native country. This afterthought of Bly will appear in the sequel to be wholly gratuitous, and yet he might naturally enough have concluded that so long and unrestrained an intercourse with a people among whom every man had his tayo or friend, among whom every man was free to indulge every wish of his heart, where from the moment he set his foot on shore he found himself surrounded by female allurements, in the midst of ease and indolence, and living in a state of luxury without submitting to any kind of labor, such enticements to a common sailor might naturally enough be supposed to create a desire for a longer residence in such a country. But this supposition is not borne out by subsequent events. The damage done to the cable was, in all probability, owing to its chafing over the rocky bottom. The bounty arrived on the 26th October, 1788, and remained till the 4th April, 1789. On the 31st March, the commander says, Today all the plants were on board, being in 774 pots, 39 tubs, and 24 boxes. The number of breadfruit plants were 1,015, besides which we had collected a number of other plants. The avi, which is one of the finest flavored fruits in the world, the aya, which is a fruit not so rich, but of a fine flavor and very refreshing, the rata, not much unlike a chestnut, which grows on a large tree in great quantities. They are singly in large pods, from one to four inches broad, and may be eaten raw, or boiled in the same manner as Windsor beans, and so dressed are equally good. The ore ab, which is a very superior kind of plantain, all these I was particularly recommended to collect, by my worthy friend, Sir Joseph Banks. While these active preparations for departure were going on, the good chief Tana, on bringing a present for King George, could not refrain from shedding tears. During the remainder of their stay, there appeared among the natives an evident degree of sorrow that they were so soon to leave them, which they showed by a more than usual degree of kindness and attention. The above-mentioned excellent chief, with his wife, brothers, and sister, requested permission to remain on board for the night previous to the sailing of the bounty. The ship was crowded the whole day with the natives, and she was loaded with presents of cocoa-nuts, plantains, breadfruits, hogs, and goats. Contrary to what had been the usual practice, there was this evening no dancing or mirth on the beach, such as they had long been accustomed to, but all was silent. At sunset the boat returned from landing to Na and his wife, and the ship made sail, bidding farewell to Otaheite, where, Bly observes, For twenty-three weeks we had been treated with the utmost affection and regard, and which seemed to increase in proportion to our stay. That we were not insensible to their kindness, the events which followed more than sufficiently prove. For to the friendly and endearing behavior of these people, may be ascribed the motives for that event which affected the ruin of an expedition, that there was every reason to hope would have been completed in the most fortunate manner. The morning after their departure they got sight of Hawhini, and a double canoe soon came alongside, containing ten natives. Among them was a young man who recollected Captain Bly, and called him by name, having known him when here in the year 1780 with Captain Cook in the Resolution. Several other canoes arrived with hogs, yams, and other provisions which they purchased. This person confirmed the account that had already been received of Omai, and said that of all the animals which had been left with Omai, the mare only remained alive, that the seeds and plants had been all destroyed, except one tree, but of what kind that was he could not satisfactorily explain. A few days after sailing from this island, the weather became squally, and a thick body of black clouds collected in the east. A water-spout was in a short time seen at no great distance from the ship, which appeared to great advantage from the darkness of the clouds behind it. The upper part is described as being about two feet in diameter, and the lower about eight inches. It advanced rapidly towards the ship, when it was deemed expedient to alter the course, and to take in all the sails, except the foresail soon after which it passed within ten yards of the stern, making a rustling noise, but without their feeling the least effect from its being so near. The rate at which it travelled was judged to be about ten miles per hour, going towards the west, in the direction of the wind, 
and in a quarter of an hour after passing the ship it dispersed. As they passed several low islands, the natives of one of them came out in their canoes, and it was observed that they all spoke the language of Otaheite. Presents of iron, beads, and a looking-glass were given to them, but it was observed that the chief, on leaving the ship, took possession of everything that had been distributed. One of them showed some signs of dissatisfaction, but after a little altercation they joined noses and were reconciled. The bounty anchored at Anamuka on the 23rd April, and an old lame man, named Tepe, whom Bly had known here in 1777, and immediately recollected, came on board along with others from different islands in the vicinity. This man having formerly been accustomed to the English manner of speaking their language, the commander found he could converse with him tolerably well. He told him that the cattle which had been left at Tongatambu had all bred, and that the old ones were yet living. Being desirous of seeing the ship, he and his companions were taken below, and the breadfruit and other plants were shown to them, on seeing which they were greatly surprised. I landed, says Bly, in order to procure some breadfruit plants, to supply the place of one that was dead, and two or three others that were a little sickly. I walked to the west part of the bay, where some plants and seeds had been sown by Captain Cook, and had the satisfaction to see, in a plantation close by, about twenty fine pineapple plants, but no fruit, this not being the proper season. They told me that they had eaten many of them, that they were very fine and large, and that at Tongatabu there were great numbers. Numerous were the marks of mourning with which these people disfigure themselves, such as bloody temples, their heads deprived of most of the hair, and which was worse, almost all of them with a loss of some of their fingers. Several fine boys, not above six years of age, had lost both their little fingers, and some of the men had parted with the middle finger of the right hand. A brisk trade soon began to be carried on for yams. Some plantains and breadfruit were likewise brought on board, but no hogs. Some of the sailing canoes, which arrived in the course of the day, were large enough to contain not less than ninety passengers. From these the officers and crew purchased hogs, dogs, fowls, and shaddocks, yams very fine and large. One of them actually weighed above forty-five pounds. The crowd of natives had become so great the next day, Sunday, twenty-six, that it became impossible to do anything. The watering party were therefore ordered to go on board, and it was determined to sail. The ship was accordingly unmoored and got under way. A grapnel, however, had been stolen, and Bly informed the chiefs that were still on board that unless it was returned they must remain in the ship at which they were surprised and not a little alarmed. I detained them, he says, till sunset, when their uneasiness and impatience increased to such a degree that they began to beat themselves about the face and eyes, and some of them cried bitterly. As this distress was more than the grapnel was worth, I could not think of detaining them longer, and called their canoes alongside. I told them they were at liberty to go, and made each of them a present of a hatchet, a saw, with some knives, gimlets, and nails. This unexpected present, and the sudden change in their situation, affected them not less with joy than they had before been with apprehension. They were unbounded in their acknowledgments, and I have little doubt that we parted better friends than if the affair had never happened. From this island the ship stood to the northward all night, with light winds. On the next day, the 27th, at noon, they were between the islands of Tefoa and Kutu. Thus far, says Bly, the voyage had advanced in a course of uninterrupted prosperity, and had been attended with many circumstances equally pleasing and satisfactory. A very different scene was now to be experienced. A conspiracy had been formed, which was to render all our past labor productive only of extreme misery and distress. The means had been concerted and prepared with so much secrecy and circumspection that no one circumstance appeared to occasion the smallest suspicion of the impending calamity. The result of an act of piracy the most consummate and atrocious that was probably ever committed. How far Bly was justified in ascribing the calamity to a conspiracy will be seen hereafter. The following chapter will detail the facts of the mutinous proceedings as stated by the lieutenant in his own words. End of chapter 2